there was a Sunday school teacher uh, who was all excited to gather the, the children for class, and she began her lesson, and she was teaching uh, about the gospel that we just heard, the story about the Pharisee and the tax collector. And she tells them, again, what we just heard, how they both went up to pray, and how the Pharisee, you know, knew that he was getting everything right, and he said that prayer, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, dot, 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 uh, or even this tax collector here. And then she tells the kids about the tax collector who stands far off and who's beating his chest and won't even look up to heaven uh, and prays, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And she starts talking to the kids about it and they get it right away, right away. Oh yes, this Pharisee's attitude is the wrong attitude. They get it and they're they're grateful um, or they're excited to see that the... um, that the tax collector um, has the right attitude. And the kids get this from the beginning, from the beginning. And the Sunday school teacher thinks, oh good, today my job is easy. I don't have to explain this too much. The kids get it. It's a great day. They have a great conversation. The class ends and they stand up to pray as is their custom in this particular Sunday school. And the Sunday school leads them in prayer. And she says, thank you, God, that you did not make us like this Pharisee. Now this um, story about a Sunday school teacher has become a bit of a cliche, uh, but I think it's a useful one. Because we, we, don't, we shouldn't ignore it. The Pharisee is in many ways getting it right. He fasts, he tithes, he's not a thief, he's faithful in his marriage, he's even grateful. His prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you God is how it starts. But he takes all this good stuff, and it is good stuff, that's supposed to orient him toward God and God's goodness, and he turns it around and makes it about himself and his own goodness, and that at the expense of the poor tax collector. And the Sunday school teacher is also great. She's offering her time. She's doing an important ministry. Uh, She's good at what she does, and her prayer, too, is a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, is how it starts. But she takes all this and turns it around and makes it about herself, especially in comparison with the Pharisee. And even as she condemns the Pharisee, she's joining her voice to the Pharisee's prayer. Now, I think before we get too far in mocking this poor Sunday school teacher, I'm wondering if there isn't some part of us, even now, that's saying some version of, thank you, God, that I'm not like this Sunday school teacher. It just keeps going. How easy is it to join our voices to the Pharisees' prayer, building ourselves up by comparing ourselves to others and tearing them down? Do you ever do this? At this time of the year, the easy um, thing, I think, is, you know, thank you, God, that I'm not like these other people. Thank you, God, I'm not depending on your persuasion, a Democrat or Republican or a liberal or conservative, but but that kind of thing. Do you ever do that? Thank you, God, that I fulfill all of my religious obligations. Thank you, God, that I am good and better than all these other people. Which really, if you push it, means something like, thank you, God, that I don't need you. How easy it is join our voices to the Pharisees' prayer, building ourselves up by comparing ourselves to others and tearing them down. There's a chapter in Thomas Merton's great small book called New Seeds of Contemplation, and the title of the chapter in there is The Root of War is Fear. And in short, in that chapter, uh, Thomas Merton says that our lives are actually pretty filled with fear. Uh, and fear of everything, and he kind of lists some of it. Uh, And he says that fear is a symptom of a lack of faith in God. And he says ultimately that what we most fear is what we know is in us, our own evil, our own sin. And because we're so afraid of that, what's in us, because we're way too afraid to actually deal with it, we try not to notice it. 
We try to pretend it's not there or at least minimize it. And, and one of the strategies that makes that more possible is to minimize it in ourselves and to exaggerate it in the people around us. If we can make their sin look really big, ours looks small by comparison. And Merton doesn't say it quite this way, but, but I've noticed in my life a kind of formula, and I use it myself um, on a regular basis. I know I do thus and such, but at least I don't do this, right? So, uh, example. Uh, I know I tell little white lies, but at least I don't cheat on my taxes. Or I know I don't always say nice things about my ex to my kids, but at least I don't call him a jerk in front of them. You, you know this formula? Have you done this? And before we know it, we seem pretty good, at least in our own eyes. And it isn't that far before we just start saying things like, everything would be so much better if everybody else would just be a little bit more like me. And Merton writes like, this is um, cute. And again, we're all recognizing this about it. So it's like, we know this and it's kind of it's funny, it's kind of cute. But he says it gets more serious than that. He says, when we see crimes in others, we try to correct it by destroying them, or at least putting them out of sight. It's easy to identify, he writes, the sin with the sinner when the sinner is someone other than our own self. You know what I mean? It's like, if I do something, it's like, okay, that's kind of a weird thing about me, um, this moment, but it's not that bad. But you, you're a sinner. And he says, it's not too many steps from there to things like bullying, and to hate crimes, to murder, to terrorism, to war. War is what the chapter's about. And so he said, it doesn't take that long to get from that, um, I'm better, I'm good, you're the one who's the problem, all the way up to war. And near the end of that chapter, he writes that though we claim to want and even pray for peace, it's our own version of peace that we want. And he says it's absurd to hope for a solid peace based on fictions and illusions, specifically the fictions and illusions about what peace even is. And then he says, and this is near the end of the chapter, if you really want true, true peace, he writes, instead of loving what you think is peace, love other people and love God above all. And instead of hating the people you think are war makers, hate the appetites and disorders in your own soul, which are the causes of war. If you love peace, then hate injustice, hate tyranny, hate greed, but hate these things in yourself. How easy it is to join our voice to the Pharisee's prayer, building ourselves up by comparing ourselves to others and tearing them down. But we did hear another prayer this morning. We didn't just hear the Pharisees' prayer that got echoed in the Sunday school teachers in our own. We heard another prayer, a prayer that recognizes and speaks the truth about us, all of us, and that lets go of fear enough and trust God enough to speak that truth. A prayer that's not about relying on our own goodness, but on God's goodness. A prayer that will make space in our lives for God to transform us, and through our transformation, for God to transform the world. And that prayer is the prayer of the tax collector who says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs>